right, welcome. So let's talk about creating or writing badass malware for OSX. So as Casey mentioned, my name is Patrick Wardle. Uh, I've worked at a bunch of acronymed places, uh, including the NSA, which I always joke is the only government agency that actually listens. Um, so now I'm the director of R&D at Synac. Uh, Synac does crowdsource vulnerability discovery. Basically, we have researchers all over the world who sign up to hack on our customers' web apps, mobile apps, IoT devices, and networks. Um, and a not-so-secret secret is that our customers' security really sucks. So we end up paying out thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to our researchers. So if this is something that interests you, definitely check out synac.com. Anyone can sign up. Uh, no commitments. It's, it's pretty cool. All right, so what are we going to be talking about today? Well, today's talk can pretty much be broken down into three parts. We're going to start by looking at uh, some current OSX malware sam samples so you get an understanding of the status quo, uh, you know, their level of sophistication, where they suck, how we can make them better, stuff like that. We're then going to talk about how we can improve on this. Uh, I'm going to talk about some ideas for infection, some novel ways for persisting. Uh, we're going to talk about some ways that we can make our malware more defensive uh, so that it can protect itself briefly touch on some features, and then finish up this part with talking about how we can bypass all of Apple's and all third-party uh, antivirus and security products. In the last part of the talk, I'm going to briefly mention some free tools that we can use to protect our Mac computers. All right, so I briefly want to talk about malware on OSX by looking at some recent and some current OSX malware specimens. Uh, as I mentioned, this will give us a good level, good understanding kind of the status quo and show us where we can improve. Um, I'm going to caveat this that obviously there are known unknowns. What I mean by this is there might be a lot of really sophisticated Mac malware out there that we just don't know about that hasn't been detected. But if we look at the Windows side, we can see there's a lot of sophisticated samples like Stuxnet, the Equation Group, Gauss, Flame, that are being detected. And those aren't necessarily being detected by the antivirus companies. They're being detected by users who submit them to VirusTotal or users who notice something weird on their computer and then submit those samples. So I would think that if there was a lot of advanced Mac malware out there, we might be seeing similar trends. But the reality is we're really not. So first, uh, some of you might be thinking, you know, why, why do we care about OSX malware? Why are we even talking about Macs? Um, this is kind of an obvious statement, just looking around. Um, but, you know, Macs are really pretty much everywhere. And if you look at the graph, you can see that in the last few years, Apple's market share has almost doubled. Uh, recently, uh, about a few weeks ago, they had a spring forward event where they talked about, uh, mostly about the Apple Watch, but they also talked about their laptop line. And they released this interesting graphic which shows that while the industry as a whole was contracting, their MacBooks were selling really, really well. And as we all know, anytime a technology becomes more prevalent, there's going to be more malware, more attacks. Uh, so this talk is definitely kind of relevant. But wait a minute. Apple says Macs don't get malware, right? They tell us you know, your Apple computer is really, really secure. Obviously, this is not true. Uh, actually, the first computer virus that was discovered in the wild, the Elk cloner, uh, infected Apple computers. Since then, we've seen Mac malware flourish, uh, maybe not quite as much as Windows malware, but in recent years, since about 2010, we've seen about five different, uh, 50 different OSX malware families. Um, and some of these even infected computers uh, of companies such as Apple, which is kind of embarrassing, and Facebook and Twitter. Uh, more interesting to me, though, we've seen examples where users have switched to Macs for security reasons, but then we've seen uh, advanced attackers go after those users specifically and be able to infect their Mac computers. So all of this shows to me that OSX malware is definitely a problem and is a reality. All right, so the first malware sample I want to talk about is the XSLCMD malware. Uh, this was a malware sample that was detected by FireEye. Uh, at the end of last year. They threw in some ATP attribution. Not to pick on FireEye too much, but I always think that their marketing department has this like, eight, you know, ATP stamp that, you know, if any malware sample is detected, they say, hey, we got to attribute this to China or something. Um, this malware, though, you know, it wasn't that sophisticated. Uh, it had uh, some features, for example, reverse shell, key logging, screen capture capabilities, um, but it really wasn't that elegant and that advanced. For example, it persisted as a launch agent. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about launch agents, but they're pretty much synonymous to Windows services. Um, so yes, they will give you persistence, but they will result in a new process showing up, a new entry. So obviously, if you're familiar with Windows malware, you know persisting as a Windows service is really not that stealthy, really not advanced. One interesting feature, though, is that it, there, it turned out that this malware did have a privilege escalation zero day embedded in it. Um, at the time of the report, this was not mentioned. I don't know if it just wasn't picked up. 
Um, but about a week ago, someone went back and noticed this fact. Um, now, this is, I've seen this trend before where the Chinese, or whoever this malware was attributed to, um, have good exploits, nice zero days, but then the products, the malware they lay down, really not that sophisticated. So on Windows, you see them you know, using some zero day to get into a network, but then installing something like Poison Ivy, some known Windows malware, and then persisting via the run key. So it's always surprising that there's this kind of uh, difference in levels of skills. So again, this isn't that surprising that this malware contained a sweet exploit, but then the rest of the malware really not that sophisticated or advanced. Another recent OSX malware sample is iWorm. Now, contrary to its name, really not a worm at all. It has no autonomous spreading capabilities, actually no spreading capabilities at all. Uh, this was also discovered uh, at, the, at the end of last year, and the way it spread was by infected torrents. So you go to Pirate Bay, be like, here's free Photoshop, and you know, of course it was infected. So if you'd run it, you would be uh, infected. Again, really not a very sophisticated piece of malware. Um, allowed a remote attacker to run a brief survey, download and execute something else. Um, and this one also persisted uh, using a launch item. In this case, it was a launch daemon. Uh, launch daemons, again, very similar to launch agents. Gonna, there's going to be a new process, a new entry. Um, so really, again, not that sophisticated. Now, the final sample I want to mention is WireLurker. Now, WireLurker garnered a lot of media attention simply because it was able to infect iPhones if the user agreed to install an enterprise certificate on the phone. Um, interestingly, though, uh, there's a great quote from one of my favorite security researchers who kind of called out what this malware was and said, okay, sure, it has this feature, which is kind of neat, but the rest of the malware is kind of crap. Um, you know, it's these binaries and scripts that are all duct taped together, really, really not that sophisticated. Um, so again, nothing too fancy here. So after looking at these various samples, these most recent OSX malware samples, we can kind of draw some conclusions and make some generalizations. Uh, so in terms of their infection vectors, most of them require user interaction social engineering. You know, they, you have to download something from some shady site and run it. Um, there are some examples of phishing, um, but again, these use either old exploits um, or, easy to, or are easy to protect against. Uh, in terms of persistence, they all use really well-known techniques, uh, the majority being launch items. Again, these are very easy to detect, very easy to prevent. In terms of self-defense, really don't see a lot of self-defense in any OSX malware. Um, there's really not that much crypto. Um, again, this makes them trivial to detect, trivial to analyze. In terms of stealth, really don't see a lot of rootkit techniques or hiding. They all just try to hide in plain sight. So if, you're look, if you look for them, you will find them. In terms of their features, I'd say this is the one area where they are sufficient. Uh, you know, they do provide capabilities for remote attackers, but these capabilities are implemented in very uh, amateurish ways. So for example, if they want a remote shell, a lot of times instead of doing that in proc to make it more stealthy, they'll just bind bin sh to a, a, a local port, um, which is very, very easy to detect. And then in terms of bypassing personal security products, really don't see any OSX malware actively enumerating these products and then trying to bypass them. So if you have a firewall like a little snitch installed, it'll catch all these OSX malware samples as they try to connect out to the internet. So overall, I like to give current OSX malware a grade of a C. Uh, again, its features are sufficient, but other than that, um, very inelegant, trivial to detect, trivial to prevent. So our goal then today is how can we improve on this, right? Apple makes some really awesome products, so I thought its malware should be equally awesome. That's my opinion. <laughs> All right, so start by looking at infection vectors. As I mentioned, most OSX malware gets on users' machines via social engineering uh, or infected uh, Trojans. So we can see we have some examples here. Uh, a lot of times you go to an infected website and it'll be like, you have to install this Flash installer or, hey, here's an update you must install. A lot of times users get tricked into installing this. Uh, similarly, if you go to an adult website, uh, like a porn website, it's going to be like, please download this codec uh, so that you can watch the content. So I've been told. Um, and then finally, there's a lot of examples where malware is spread via infected apps on uh, torrent sites, third-party app stores, stuff like that. Now, this does work. There are some, you know, there's no patch for human stupidity. There's dumb users out there, so they are going to infect themselves. But this really is not going to get you widespread infection. Uh, it's not going to get you targeted users. It's not going to get you advanced users. Um, and Apple is also building in some technologies like Gatekeeper, which will block unsigned or malicious code, even if the user like, double clicks it to run. So it's interesting, though, that we still all download software from the internet. Uh, the Mac App Store is super constrictive, so most Mac software is still distributed uh, outside the Mac App Store. 
Now, the problem is if this is distributed insecurely over HTTP, a network level adversary could, in theory, uh, modify in transit, inject some malicious code, and then infect you in this way. Uh, Apple does have some technology called Gatekeeper, which will detect this, but we'll talk about how we can get around that later. So you might be thinking, all right, it's 2015, how much software is really distributed over HTTP? Well, this is my doc, and as we can see, about two-thirds or so of the software is distributed over HTTP. So, for example, I wanted to download some of the software, I'd go to the developer's website, the company's website, download, and the download would be uh, over HTTP. Now, this isn't because everyone is lazy and dumb. I mean, some of these companies, maybe. Um, it's more that they understand that there's a difference between securing a download and then validating the download, and I understand that as well. The problem is they all depend on Gatekeeper to verify, to validate that nothing's been modified in transit. So if we can find a way to get around Gatekeeper, which we can and I'll show you, we've basically just opened up a really great infection vector. Again, you still might be thinking, okay, Patrick, you're a security researcher, you're downloading you know, security tools from SourceForge, of course that's not going to be over HTTPS, and that's a kind of a fair point. Um, so I said, okay, I'll look at all the third-party uh, OSX security products. Um, and at the time of my research, which was uh, end of March, every single third-party OSX security product I downloaded was over HTTPS, sorry, over HTTP. So if you go to, say, Kaspersky's website and download Kaspersky Antivirus for Mac, it was downloaded over HTTP. So again, this means a network-level adversary could use this as a great infection vector if they had access and could see the download. Another cool thing about these security products is they all need root to install. So as an attacker, if you can infect the download when it's run and, a and asks the user for root privileges, once they put in their username and password, you now have root access on the box. All right, so now I want to talk about persistence, which is something that all malware basically requires or strives for. Uh, in the context of this talk, when I'm talking about persistence, I'm talking about giving malware automatic code execution, re-execution every time the computer is restarted or the user logs in. So I mentioned current methods, pretty much launch items or login items. Uh, the problem with these from a malware's point of view or an attacker's point of view is they're well known and they're easy to detect, easy to prevent. Uh, so here's two examples. We can see Mac Protector, which is another OSX malware sample. Uh, it's like a rogue AV product. Uh, we can see it persists as a login item. Now this is the Apple suggested way to persist an application. So yes, it'll work. It will automatically execute the malware every time the user logs in. But the problem is, if you go look at your login items, you will see the malware installed there. So obviously for malware, anytime you show up in some UI, this is, this is not, obviously not a good thing. Uh, similarly, launch daemons and launch agents, launch items, are pretty easy to detect as well. So remember Wirelurker, that really advanced malware sample that infected iPhone? It installs four launch daemons. So again, think on the Windows side, if there's a piece of malware that installs four Windows services, you're going to be like, wow, this malware is really lame, really not sophisticated, super easy to see. So yeah, so if you're infected with Wirelurker, you're going to have four new malicious processes running on your box. Really not that stuff. So yeah, current methods kind of suck, so I want to talk about some better methods that are a little more stealthy um, and have some other benefits as well. So the first technique I want to talk about is binary infection. Uh, this is definitely an old school technique, but it has a lot of benefits. So first, it's pretty stealthy. Uh, if you inject all your viral code into a legitimate process, there's not going to be any new processes or even any other files on the file system. It's also difficult to disinfect. Now, I really like this. Uh, a lot of Current OSX malware is very easy for the antivirus companies to automatically detect and delete. Uh, once they detect it, they just delete the binary, delete the auto-run plist entry, and the box is, is clean. Uh, however, if you infected a binary, uh, that's a lot more difficult to automatically extract the malicious code and restore the binary, uh, something that's probably not going to happen automatically. Another benefit is you achieve low time uh, process in injection, and also you might be able to bypass personal security products. So think about it, if you infect the user's browser, every time the browser starts, your malicious code will get executed as well. This is nice because it gives you uh, access into their browsing session, you can grab passwords, see where they're going, credit card information, and also if there's a firewall installed on the box, uh, it's likely that the browser is going to be able to access the internet, and if your code is in the browser, it should also be able to access the internet. There's one problem though, on OSX, the loader validates all digital signatures. So here you, we can see if we try to infect Safari, Next time user, uh, the user starts Safari, the loader will detect that it's been tampered with and just crash the app and kill it and not allow it to run. So if we look at how this mechanism works and figure out you know, how secure it is, uh, if you look at the source code or kind of do some reverse engineering, you can see that the loader looks for this LC code signature block. If it finds this block, it then verifies the binary's signature. 
Recall, though, unlike iOS, on OS X, unsigned applications are allowed to run. So what we could do is simply remove this block, and then the loader will allow it to run. The loader has no state. Uh, it doesn't say, hey, this application used to be signed and now is not signed, something weird is going on. Or it doesn't say, hey, this is an Apple binary that used to be signed, or it's just an Apple binary, why isn't it signed, I'm going to block it. No, it basically says, oh, I can't find that you know, LC code signature block, uh, I can't really say anything, I'm going to allow it to run. So what we can do is simply uh, now infect uh, all sorts of binaries. So how do we do this? Well, similar to Windows infecting PE files, there's a myriad of ways you can go about infecting Mako executables. Uh, some simple ways, you could hijack the entry point, you could add a new uh, dependency so every time it's run it pulls in your library as well. Again, all sorts of ways. Um, in terms of benefits, again, self-contained, somewhat difficult to detect, and also difficult to disinfect. Another persistence mechanism, one of my favorites, is dilib hijacking. Uh, you need a vulnerable application, but if you have a vulnerable application, all you need to do is drop a dilib, and then you get persistence. Uh, if we look at the diagram, this kind of explains how this all works, and it's conceptually almost identical to DLL hijacking on Windows. So we have an application in this case uh, that's trying to load a dilib blah.dilib, and because this application is vulnerable, the loader is going to look in multiple locations for the dilib. We can see it's first going to look in the applications directory, and then, and only then, is it going to look in the system directory, where the legitimate blah.dilib actually lives. So what an attacker can do is plant or place a malicious dilib with the same name in that primary search directory. Now, any time that application is start, started, the loader is going to naively find the attacker's dilib and then blindly load that, giving the attacker uh, persistence. So it makes an application vulnerable. Um, there's a variety of scenarios. One is if a, a binary or an application has a weak dependency and that dilib is not there, the attacker can then put a dilib there and the loader will naively and blindly find the dilib from then on. Another scenario is a little more complicated, um, but is actually more common. Basically, there's this... Uh, these type of dilibs called run path dependent dilibs. Uh, and basically, they tell the loader to look in multiple locations. So again, if the legitimate dilib is not in the primary run path search directory, an attacker can uh, plant a dilib there. So I wrote a white paper uh, about this, kind of goes into more technical details. Uh, so if you're more interested in this technique, to check it out. Uh, it's on Virus Bulletin. So as I mentioned, dilib hijacking does require vulnerable applications, uh, but it turns out there's a ton of them. Uh, this is a scan from just my box. I found about 150 of them. You can see that Apple has a ton of them. Uh, Microsoft products, a lot of them are vulnerable as well. And then a lot of third-party applications. So how do you use this for persistence? So in order to persist, you need an application that's automatically started by the operating system, or automatically started when the user logs in, that is also vulnerable to a dilib hijack. Well, it turns out there's actually a bunch of these. Bunch of these. One example is the iCloud Photo Stream agent. Uh, this is automatically started by the operating system and vulnerable to a uh, dilib hijack attack. So what we do is we configure our malicious dilib so that it's compatible with the dilib that we're hijacking, and then we copy it to the primary search path where the loader will look first, and then every time the box is restarted, the loader will find our malicious dilib and automatically load it. So again, we now have persistence. Uh, the benefits of this technique is it's novel. It's always good to use a novel technique. Uh, there's not going to be any new processes. Because your malicious code is a dilib, dynamic library, which is basically the same thing as a DLL on Windows, it's going to be hosted within the context of a trusted process. So the user is not just going to be able to look at their process list and see some new malicious process. This technique also requires no mo binary modification or OS modifications. All you're doing is dropping a dilib in a special location. That's it. You're not modifying the file system or modifying uh, you know, plist files or unsigning binaries, so it's kind of stealthy in that technique. It also abuses legitimate functionality of the operating system. Anytime you have a technique that abuses legitimate functionality, this is awesome because it's unlikely to be broken by a patch or fixed by Apple. So another technique uh, that allows us to persist that's somewhat similar because it's also an in-proc technique uh, is using plugins. So OSX, there's a lot of system processes that can be legitimately extended by plugins. So what a malicious attacker can do or malware can do is simply register a plugin um, and then get automatic code execution every time the computer is restarted. So an example of this is Spotlight and Spotlight importers or Spotlight plugins. Uh, Spotlight is the technology on your Mac that does all the indexing. Uh, it comes with some built-in plugins so that it can index uh, Word documents, PDF files, stuff like that. But it allows you to customize it. For example, if you want to index uh, custom files, it 
can be extended via plugins. So malware can create a malicious uh, spotlight plugin that will be automatically executed. So the way we do this, uh, you can actually create a spotlight plugin. There's a template in Xcode. Um, and then what you do is you, once you create it and add your malicious code, you basically tell it what kind of file you're going to index. So this, in this example, we're going to index Objective-C source code files. This means any time the user opens or edits or prints an Objective-C source code file, our plugin will be loaded and then stay uh, resident in, in memory. So once we do this, once we copy this to the library uh, spotlight directory, every time the box is rebooted and the user opens this kind of file, our plugin will get automatically loaded. Again, the benefits, no new processes, it's always a good thing. Uh, it's on demand. This is both a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because if there's an antivirus product that's, say, scanning all processes and dilibs once the user logs in, our plugin probably won't be loaded yet because uh, it only will be loaded kind of on demand. It's also a cool way to, uh, you know, sniff data. So think about it. When you get on a box, you probably want to grab all the user's mail, all their Word documents if you're trying to gather intelligence. Um, the kind of naive way is just to search the hard drive for, you know, Word documents. Uh, using this technique, if you register yourself as an indexer for Word documents, um, you will then be able to access in real time the documents the user is opening, editing, printing, saving, which is probably the documents you're interested in. And again, this technique is legitimate, right? This is legitimate functionality of the OS. Um, so again, always good to abuse such kind of things. Now, if you want a plugin that's a little more deterministic, say you're on a box and the person's not a developer, so they're not going to be opening Objective-C files, you can just register for the plugin uh, public.data file type. And this basically tells Spotlight, hey, I index everything, please automatically load me as soon as the computer is restarted. So this is how to get a more deterministic persistence. All right, so that was slicker, stealthier persistence mechanisms. What about self-defense protection? So I've always wondered why malware doesn't take a more active role at protecting itself. Um, you know, on the Windows side of the house, sure you see malware that, you know, employs custom packeters uh, to maybe uh, hinder analysis. Um, but on the OSX side, you really don't see a lot of this. Um, there's a, there is some crypto, mostly they munch some strings or the network traffic might be protected. But it's usually like XOR or something really lame. Um, and then in terms of stealth trying to protect itself from being detected, they just hide in plain sight. So it'll be like, I'll name myself Apple something and no one will find me. And that's pretty much all they do. The problem with this, from the malware's point of view, is this makes it really easy for the antivirus company. It makes it really easy to detect this malware, makes it trivial to analyze, and then very easy to disinfect, right? The antivirus products can pretty much always automatically delete the malware, which I don't think is good from a malware's point of view. So let's first talk about some self-defense mechanisms starting with protecting our malware. So I think it's generally a good idea to encrypt your malware. Uh, makes it more difficult to analyze and a lot of times can reduce detection rates as well. So we're going to start with a simple method that leverages the fact that the OSX loader natively supports the ability to run uh, encrypted code. So this is the source code from the uh, OSX loader. And what we can see is if it comes across a segment as it's loading a binary that has this SG protected version one flag, it will decrypt the binary for us. So this is awesome. One thing to note though, that the first three pages of the segment are skipped. This is important to note because obviously you don't want to put any sensitive content or code in there because it's not going to be encrypted. So Apple uses this to protect some of their binaries. For example, if you try to disassemble finder.app, you'll get this error message from Ida saying, hey, this is encrypted, I can't you know, disassemble. A little more information. Uh, this encryption scheme, they use Blowfish. They used to use AES, but now they use Blowfish. Um, this is Apple's hard-coded encryption key. Um, yeah, I put it on a slide. Hopefully <laughs> they don't sue me. Uh, also, then, because it's a static encryption um, scheme with a hard-coded key, uh, symmetrical encryption, there are tools that can uh, decrypt it. So, yes, there are tools to decrypt it. I did not find any tools that allow you to automatically encrypt arbitrary uh, Mako binary, so I, I wrote one myself. Um, really not that complicated. Um, but the one thing I mentioned, since the first three pages are skipped, uh, it's a good idea to make sure that sensitive information is not there. So one way to do that, a uh, pretty easy way, is to create uh, a padding function, a function that's aligned to a three-page uh, three alignment. And then if you put this at the start of your binary, which you can do with symbol ordering flags, when you compile your binary, basically the first three pages are blank. This is awesome because this means that none of your source code um, or strings or anything else will be unprotected. 
So once we do this, uh, we compile this, this malware. We can see when we run strings before it's encrypted. All the strings, method calls are there. So an analyst looking at this would very easily be able to triage this. Um, we then run our protection um, executable, which just takes the mock O binary and encrypts it with the Blowfish algorithm and that hard-coded static uh, key from Apple. And then we run the strings command again, and we can see that all the method calls and all the strings have been uh, protected. So that's awesome. This is also uh, helps uh, lessen detection. So I took some known OSX malware samples from VirusTotal, and once I encrypted them with this, this manner, we saw that about 50% of the AV products that previously detected it did not detect it. Um, again, this technique is free in the sense that once you encrypt it, Mac uh, and Mac OS X will still understand it. You don't have to write a custom loader. But since it uses a symmetrical encryption scheme with a static key, it's fairly easy still for people to automatically decrypt it. So let's talk about a technique that's a little more sophisticated and will tie our malware directly to a specific target. Now this is a good technique because if you read a lot of the malware reports that come out for the more advanced, maybe nation state malware, they generally start by saying, a user uploaded a sample to virus total that had zero detections. And then like six months later, the AV guys are doing all sorts of back-end heuristics and they find out, whoa, this is actually some really cool new malware. Um, so we want to prevent this in the sense that if the, if the malware is taken off the box for analysis, it cannot be encrypted, decrypted. So one way to do this, this is a public technique, uh, and it's based on a research paper that was titled Environmental Key Generation Towards Clueless Agents. Uh, there's some mathematical constructs that are detailed in that paper. Uh, I'll read them quickly. Uh, you have N, which is an environmental observation. This should be unique to your target. You then have H, which is just a hash function. You have M, which is uh, the hash or double hash of that observation N. This is what is needed for activation and is carried within the agent and then you have a key. So what happens is at runtime, the malware requeries its environment to get this environmental observation N, hashes that twice, and then if that double hash matches the embedded double hash, it knows that the single hash is its decryption key. So this means if it's taken off target, for example, uploaded to virus total, if they then try to run it in a sandbox, the malware will start executing, requery its environment, that N value will be different, so when it goes and double hashes that, the double hash won't match. Uh, and since hash functions are theoretically one way, the malware itself doesn't know what its key is. It knows how to recognize when it's in the right environment and regenerate that key, but if it's not in that environment, it's gonna be unable to uh, decrypt itself. Thus, it's called clueless. Now, we have seen this on the Windows side of the house. Uh, the equation uh, malware utilized this technique. I think also Gauss used this to protect uh, a payload component that, as far as I know, has not been publicly cracked, uh, even though it's been several years. So this kind of attests to the, the power and strength of this technique. All right, so we have this nicely encrypted binary that we either download just in time from a command and control server, so that's never on the file system, or it can be installed on the file system, but uh, it'll be encrypted and tied to that target. Either case, since we're using custom crypto, we have to load this in some way, right? We need a custom loader. Uh, on Windows, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with writing PE loaders in shellcode. Uh, you know, this is kind of a pain in the butt though, right? You have to map the image, you have to load the dependencies, link the dependencies, set up things for exception handling, uh, make sure it's compatible with 32-bit code, 64 code, pain in the butt. Well, it turns out that OSX actually supports in-memory loading, which is awesome. So basically, yeah, OSX makes it really easy to execute a file image directly out of memory. So this is how you do it. Uh, Apple used to host the sample code, but not on their website anymore. But if you Google memory-based bundle, uh, this example code will come up. So pretty much all we need to do uh, in about five steps is, okay, so we have our encrypted file in, in memory. We use uh, you know, the environmental decryption technique to decrypt it, and then we still have a flat file in memory. So now we have to uh, invoke these APIs so that it gets um, you know, the dependencies linked in, gets mapped in, all those fun things. So first we call NS create object file image from memory. Um, this creates the memory image. We then link it via NS link module. Uh, then step three, we look up the symbol via NS lookup symbol in module. Then we get the address of the symbol and then we can call it. So that's all you have to do uh, to get in memory loading of files on OS X. So kind of nice that Apple supports that. Now there's a myriad of other ways that malware could um, you know, protect itself, defend itself. Uh, I just wanted to throw a few other random ones out there. 
So first, I thought it should be, I thought malware should make it a little harder to delete itself. All OSX malware I've seen so far uh, can be automatically deleted. If an antivirus product detects it, it's very easy for them to just pretty much call delete on the file to clean it up. Uh, turns out though, on Mac, if you invoke the change flag uh, command with the SCH flag, it will make whatever file, so your dilib, your malware executable, it will make it undeletable unless the user boots into single user mode. So here we can see I, as root, uh, set this file, and then again, as root, I try to delete the file, and the operating system would not let me delete this. So this just complicates deletion. Uh, antivirus products now will probably no longer be able to automatically delete this because they would somehow have to force the computer to boot into single user mode um, and then delete the file from there. So kind of a cool technique to make the malware harder to delete. Another technique is uh, self-monitoring, right? And this basically will answer the question, have I been compromised? So for a piece of malware, the worst thing for it is for it to be detected. So I thought, you know, malware should be able to determine that and say, hey, look, I have been detected or I am about to be detected. So on Mac, you can monitor the local file system in a variety of ways. You can use the FS events API or you can use dtrace either as a standalone script or in proc. And then this will allow you to say or detect things like, hey, someone is just copying my malware's dilib to a USB drive. And then be like, no, prevent that, format the hard drive, you know, do something, uh, active defense. Similarly, again, a lot of times, malware is initially detected not by the antivirus companies, but by users emailing it out, uploading it to VirusTotal, stuff like that. Again, this is generally not done um, on a standalone computer. I mean, the user is like, just unsure of this file, so they usually just upload it from the box where the malware is executing. So the malware should not let this happen. The malware should basically be monitoring network comms or something and say, hey, if I see a copy of myself being uploaded to VirusTotal, I should block that and then, you know, kill the box because I've basically been detected. Another thing that I think would be really cool is to register a hash or some unique strings in your malware with Google as a Google AdWord. Um, of course, also do lots of other benign hashes so, you know, your hash doesn't stick out. But if you guys are like me, anytime I get an unknown binary, something that may be malware, I go to Google and Google the hash. I want to say, hey, does the AV companies already know about this? Is this a known whitelisted file? So I thought it'd be really cool if you had registered your hash as a Google AdWord, because then if someone in, say, Russia found your malware and started to Google it, you would get an alert that says, hey, someone in Russia is Googling this hash. Um, you know, your malware will still be compromised, but it would give you kind of an early warning and allow you to go, you know, delete all your other malware samples from around the world. All right, so that's self-defense. Now let's briefly talk about some features. As I mentioned, current OSX malware has sufficient features, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about those. Um, but I do want to talk about process injection because it's a technique that I don't see a lot of malware using that I think it should use because it's a very powerful technique. Um, and also the public sources that I found were either outdated or broken. So Mac Hacker's Handbook talks about how to do this on 32-bit systems but does not have code for 64-bit systems. Um, the new OSX book website, the guy that wrote OSX Internals, great book by the way, he has some sample for 64-bit code but it's broken. I emailed him and he was like, well, I don't want, you know, it's intentionally broken, I don't want people to write, you know, shellcode, malware, stuff like that. But we're all adults here, so I'm gonna explain exactly how to do it. So the first step, operationally, is to figure out what your target is running. The target being the uh, external process you want to inject into. Now this is generally not mentioned in all these articles or blogs, and, but you know, when you're on a box injecting into uh, a processes, it's really important to know if it's 32-bit or 64-bit, so you make sure to inject the correct uh, shellcode. Turns out it's pretty easy. Uh, you basically just call the proc PID info uh, function, and this will, you give it the PID of the external process that you're about to inject into. And then this will return a structure that's filled out that includes a flag that will be set if it's 64, 64 bit. So basically you can now tell if remote processes are either 64 bit or 32 bit. Uh, most Apple processes are going to be 64 bit, but a, a lot of third party uh, applications that you may want to inject into are still 32 bit. So again, it's good to figure out exactly uh, what architecture they are. So here's the shell code we're going to inject. This is directly from the uh, Mac OS X internals website. Um, obviously your shell code could do anything. This is just a simple example, three easy steps. We'll pull a, um, a dilib into a remote process. So the first thing we do is we call pthread set self. Now what this does is it promotes the injected mock thread into uh, pthread. This is really important because a lot of POSIX APIs expect the thread to be a uh, fully promoted pthread. So if you don't call this 
bunch of random APIs will crash. It's annoying to figure out. So once you do this, and now your thread's a, a pthread, you call DL open, which is similar to load library on Windows, and this will load your dynamic library into the context of the external remote process. And then here, the shellcode just sleeps, it lets the dilib go off and do its stuff. Again, you could do more advanced things, but this works. So now we have the shellcode, how do we actually inject it into the remote process and kick off code execution? So the first thing we do is call task for PID. This gives us uh, authorization rights to create remote threads, remotely allocate memory, stuff like that. So once you have this access, you call mock VM allocate. And what you do is you allocate space for your shellcode and also space for your remote stack. You then call mock VM write to copy in the shellcode. Step four, you call VM protect just to change the uh, memory permissions to make it executable. And then in step five, you call thread create running, which is Again, similar to create remote thread on Windows, this will actually kick off your shellcode. So this is how it looks in code. Uh, at the top we have shellcode, this is the 64-bit version. Just have the steps I mentioned, you can see we get the task for PID, um, allocate the memory, copy in our shellcode, set it to be executable, and then finally at the bottom, we set up this thread context where we set the address of the stack pointers and the uh, instruction pointer, and then we kick off the shellcode with uh, create, uh, thread create running and this will pull in our dilib. So this is how you do process injection, runtime process injection. So runtime run process injection is nice because it allows you to target uh, arbitrary processes, but it does have some down, downsides. So first and foremost, you have to have an external monitoring component that's waiting for the process you want to inject into. So think about injecting into the user's browser, right? You have to have something that's externally persisting, that's monitoring the processes, waiting for the user to spin up the browser and then inject code into it. So there's kind of extra uh, pieces there that may be detected. It's also a touch complex. I mean, you're doing, uh, you know, shell code, remote thread injection, stuff like that. I mean, it's not too complicated, but, you know, it's a little bit complicated. Also, it might be detected, right? There's really not a lot of good reasons why process A should be remotely allocating and remotely starting threads in process B. Um, so load time process injection uh, is, a, is a technique that can also get you code into a remote process at load time, and it doesn't really suffer from any of these techniques. So here's an example. Uh, we're going to use dilib hijacking to get code to be automatically loaded at load time into Xcode whenever it's started. We can see that, again, we configure our dilib uh, so that it is compatible with the dilib we're going to hijack for Xcode. We copy it then to the primary search directory, and now every time Xcode is started, our dilib is automatically executed and loaded into uh, Xcode. Now, I, I picked Xcode because I thought it would be kind of a cool target for malware. Uh, think about it, if you're on a box and the developer is building applications for deployment, uh, malware could kind of use this as an autonomous propagation vector, where it could infect the, um, the developer's applications as they're being built, um, kind of in a stealthy way. This isn't a novel idea, you're right, Ken Thompson's uh, Reflections on Trust paper kind of talked about if you infect the compiler or uh, modify the compiler, you can't even trust code that you're, you're building. So this is kind of a, a realization of that. All right, so let's talk now about bypassing some security products. Because you can have the most advanced malware in the world, but once it gets caught, it's pretty much game over. So we'll start by looking at Apple security products, and then we'll look at third-party ones as well. So currently, Apple has a variety of um, security products or built-in anti-malware malware mitigations that we'll talk about that do a pretty good job detecting all known, publicly known um, OSX malware. And Apple loves this fact because they go like, oh my goodness, our you know, security techniques block this malware. You know, your Macs, again, are all secure. Well, it turns out, really easy to bypass basically all of these. Um, so, you know, Apple, well, yeah. <laughs> So let's start with looking at Gatekeeper. Uh, remember I mentioned that pretty much everyone downloads software over HTTP. Basically they all count on Gatekeeper to verify the digital signature and to make sure that the software has not been modified in transit. So Gatekeeper you know, has or does a pretty good job of this. Um, it also blocks unsigned code or code that Apple has revoked the certificates for to protect dumb users. So, now if a user goes to Pirate Bay and downloads an infected application, Gatekeeper will probably block it. Um, sure, there's ways to kind of get around this if the user knows what they're doing. You know, you can like right click on the, on the application, allow it to run, stuff like that. But for the majority of users, uh, Gatekeeper will protect them. So how does Gatekeeper work? So the all content that is downloaded from the internet, Gatekeeper uh, 
basically will check it. And it checks it because this downloaded content gets flagged with a quarantine attribute. Then when the user double clicks it or the OS kicks it off, this automatically invokes Gatekeeper and G Gatekeeper will verify to make sure that the downloaded software adheres to the user settings. So the user settings can either be only, only allow code from the Mac App Store or the default which is Mac App Store and sign code. You can also allow code to run from anywhere but this is generally not done. Uh, Gatekeeper, as I mentioned, does a good job. Uh, it blocks uh, malicious downloads from you know, random third party app stores, uh, infected torrents, and also generally detects man in the middle attacks. The problem is that Gatekeeper only verifies the application that's being run. In other words, it does not look at external content. Now, this is generally not a problem unless the application is loading this external content. So this is what we're gonna do to bypass Gatekeeper. We're first gonna find an Apple signed or Mac App Store approved application that contains an external relative reference to a dialib that we can hijack. We're then gonna create a zip file or a DMG image that contains this necessary folder structure um, that allows us then to place this dialib in that externally referenced location. Uh, we could also inject this into an existing download if we have network level access. Uh, and then we're gonna laugh at Apple. So step one, we need to find an application, uh, as I mentioned, that's trusted by Gatekeeper, that's you know, Mac App Store approved or signed by Apple, that contains an externally relative reference. So it turns out that instruments.app uh, fits the bill. Instruments.app is um, an application that's signed by Apple, so Gatekeeper will allow it to run no matter what your settings are. Um, and if we use OTool to dump its uh, imports, its uh, dependencies, we can see it has an external relative reference. Uh, into this shared frameworks directory. Now this is because Instruments in is installed under Xcode, which is Apple's IDE. So when it runs, it kind of goes up and looks into Xcode's shared framework directory and loads dialibs from there. So what we can do now is we can build a DMG image that has the same directory structure. Uh, so at the top, you can see that there's the Instruments in this application folder. And then up above it, these are these external uh, folders that uh, instruments will look for. And specifically, we have the shared framework folder with our malicious core simulator uh, dialib in there. Now, if the user download, if we can co coerce the user to download this or we inject this into a legitimate download, if they see this, they're going to be like, what is this? What do I click? This looks suspicious. So we obviously want to clean this up, make this look a little more believable. So what we can do is we can hide the files and folders that we don't want the user to see. We can set a top level alias that points directly to instruments.app, so when they double click it, it will kick that off. And then we can also change the icon, change the background, and then also make the DMG read only so that when the user double clicks it, it'll pop up. So if we able to do all that, we get this download. Uh, this is our DMG file. So again, if you're downloading a Flash installer and someone injects all this malicious code into it and this is what you get, you're still probably gonna run on this, right? It's pretty, pretty convincing. So let's look at how this all works. So again, we have Gatekeeper set to uh, its most uh, paranoid settings. It says only allow code from the Mac App Store. We then have our malicious DMG file. This could also be a zip file or again, injected into an existing download. When you run it, there will be a, a pop-up. This is the standard pop-up that will occur for any downloaded software. So even, though we did, even if we had not injected any malicious code, the user would still see this, right? So if you go download Chrome or anything, this is just a pop-up that you'll get for any downloaded software. So once the user clicks open, which they likely will because they are downloading software, um, you can see in the output at the bottom, our unsigned malicious dialib was loaded and allowed to execute. Now this is a problem because Gatekeeper is set to only allow code from the Mac App Store. So using this technique, we can bypass Gatekeeper. So let's talk about Xprotect. Xprotect is Apple's built-in antivirus product. What it does is it detects and blocks malware, again, protecting users. So even today, if a user went to Pirate Bay and downloaded an infected application that was infected with a known variant of iWorm, when they go to double-click it, Xprotect will basically pop up and be like, hey, this is infected. I'm not going to allow you to run this even though you double-clicked it. So here we can see iWorm getting, uh, getting flagged. If we look a little more into Xprotect, we can see it's a very, very basic antivirus product. So here's the actual signature for iWorm. We can see that it's mash matching on a hash and a file name. So this is pretty lame because it means it's trivial to bypass in a variety of ways. So first you can simply recompile the malware. This will obviously change the hash. 
and then it won't be detected. If you're writing new malware, you don't even have to worry about xProtect because it's purely signature based for known malware. Or in this case, since it's matching, matching on a hash and a file name, you change the name of the malware, it won't be detected anymore. So it's kind of a lame technique, very easy to bypass. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the Apple Sandbox. So the Apple Sandbox is actually a decent uh, technology. It's built on top of BSD's mandatory access control framework. So, you know, maybe, maybe this is why it's, it's, it's better, right? Apple didn't write it from the ground up. Uh, so apps that are sandbox are ones that come from the Mac App Store and some of Apple's native, app, native apps, uh, I believe like mail.app, FaceTime, stuff like that. So obviously a sandbox app cannot access uh, components for example, on the operating system. So if you uh, exploit a sandbox application, you have to find a way to uh, escape out of it. So the technology in the sandbox is actually pretty solid. Um, but our friends at Google, for example, Ian, who will be talking uh, later today, finds all sorts of awesome bugs that can be used to uh, escape the sandbox. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. Ian will be talking about that. But basically, there's a lot of kernel level bugs, other bugs that um, code within uh, sandbox apps can use to escape the sandbox. So currently, it's really not much of a, a showstopper. Now, in order to protect the kernel um, from malicious code, rootkits, starting with Mavericks, all kernel extensions or kecks have to be signed. Uh, if you try to load an unsigned kernel extension or try to infect an existing kernel extension, it will not be allowed to load. It will be blocked by the operating system. Now, this is not a novel security mechanism. Uh, Windows, since Vista, I think 64-bit, has been doing this for years. And it's actually you know, a decent idea from a security point of view. So if we look into how this all works. Um, so if you execute a command like kexload, which is the command line tool to load a kernel extension, you can see what it does is it sends an, uh, an IPC message, talks to this user mode daemon called kexd. And kexd is actually what loads the kernel extension. Now, kexd is open source, so we can look at the source code. And if we look at it, we can see it is responsible for verifying the signature of the kernel extension. Now this is lame, this is not good, because this is done in user mode, where the attacker is, right? The attacker is trying to load code into the kernel. So the, the checks uh, on the signature of the kernel extension are not done in kernel mode, they're done in user mode. So what this means is that an attacker can subvert the user mode checks, because they're running in user mode, and bypass that. So this is exactly what we do. This was a technique that was described by a guy named OSX Reverser. So this is not my technique, this is his technique. Uh, works great, just want to mention it. So what we could do is we can attach to kexd. We could uh, obviously inject code into this, and this is what a piece of malware would do. But let's do it with the debugger so we can illustrate this a little more clearly. So what we do is we attach to kexd, and then we disassemble the check kext signature function. And then what we do is we just uh, patch the return value so it always returns zero which in this case means that the kernel extension is signed. Once we do that, we can use kex load, load an unsigned kernel extension, and it will be allowed to load into the kernel. Now, that technique works, but it's a little complicated. You're doing runtime code injection, disassembly, patching. Turns out there's actually even an easier method. So remember, kex load is the utility that loads um, kernel extensions by means of kexd. Well, it turns out if kexd is unloaded or MIA, basically kex load cannot talk to kexd, Kexload will try to load the kernel extension directly into the kernel itself. Now, it turns out on Mavericks, Kexload didn't contain any checks on the signature of the kernel extension. And since the kernel doesn't do any checks, you could just use Kexload to directly load unsigned kernel extensions. I told Apple, Apple's fix was just to add checks to Kexload. Now, obviously, this is not really a fix because what you can do is you can patch Kexload. You know, it's just a command line utility that runs in user mode. Or you can just download the source code for kexload, uh, comment out the check, recompile it, and now you have a nice little utility that you can carry around with you to load unsigned kernel extensions. So again, here you see we first unload kexd. This then tells kexload to talk directly to the, uh, to the kernel, and since we patched out the checks, it allows our unsigned kernel extension to run. Now you do need root to still load kernel extensions, so those techniques are not a privilege escalation. Um, Ian finds all sorts of awesome bugs that can be used for privilege escalation. I just want to demo one here. Um, this is uh, the root, root pipe vulnerability. So root pipe was discovered, uh, I would say, last year, supposedly patched by Apple um, in 10.3.3. Um, but I looked at their patch, and it turns out the way they patched it was absurd. So it'd be very easy, it was very easy to sidestep their patch and still exploit the vulnerable vulnerability, even on a fully patched Mac computer. So this is just a little video. Um, it basically shows me first 
doing an ls of the root directory, looking at this file called Phoenix. I then tried to create this file called Phoenix, but I'm not root, so obviously this is going to fail. I then execute a little Python script which triggers the exploit sidestepping Apple's patch. Uh, does a bunch of things. And then if we uh, ls root again, we can see that the file has been created. We look at who it's owned by, it's owned by root. And then if we look at the contents of it, we can see that uh, it contains whatever we want. So this is a great exploit because it's a logic bug and it, what it does is it allows you to create or overwrite any file on the file system as root with any, any content you want. So obviously this makes it very easy to escalate privileges. All right, so Apple's built-in malware mitigations, in my opinion, kind of a joke. So what about third-party ones? Well, most of these are simply signature-based antivirus products, so they're trivial to bypass. Uh, if you're writing new OSX malware, they will not detect your malware because they don't have a signature for it. Some, though, like Little Snitch, uh, are more behavior-based, uh, Little Snitch being a firewall that will block outgoing connections. So they're basically agnostic toward malware. So we have to do a little more work to get around them. So as I mentioned, Little Snitch is kind of the de facto firewall personal security product for OSX. I run it on my computer, we run it at my company, I know lots of people that run it. Um, and it does actually a pretty good job. Basically, what it does is anytime an untrusted process or new outgoing connection um, occurs, a little snitch will pop up and basically say, hey, do you want to allow this connection? So all the previous OSX malware samples I talked about would be detected by this tool. You'd get a pop-up saying, hey, some unknown process is now trying to talk to some random IP address. Uh, you know, it's still up to the user to allow or block this, but, you know, it's kind of a good, 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 good way to detect unknown malware. So our goal is to basically bypass this to allow our malware to access the network in an uninhibited manner. So Little Snitch kind of takes a binary approach in the sense that it trusts known processes or allows the user to create blanket rules. So on my box, GPG Keychain is allowed to talk to any network endpoint. This kind of makes sense because it has to talk to random key servers, update itself. So there's a little Snitch rule that says GPG Keychain can talk to whatever. The problem is GPG Keychain is vulnerable to a Dilib hijack attack. So what we can do is we can plant a malicious Dilib in the primary run path search directory for GPG Keychain, and then anytime GPG Keychain is started, either by the user or programmatically, sorry, in the background by the, uh, by the attacker or the malware, our Dilib will get pulled into the process context of uh, GPG Keychain, and then we'll be allowed to talk out to the internet. Little Stitch will see the connection, but will say, oh, it's GPG Keychain, I allow it out. So this is great. This is one way to bypass Little Snitch. So that's not super generic. Uh, it requires the user to have uh, you know, a vulnerable copy of GPG Keychain, stuff like that. However, if we look at Little Snitch's rules, we can see that there is an undeletable system rule that says anybody can talk to iCloud. Now, I guess they were thinking that generally Macs are synced with one iCloud account, which is the user's iCloud account, so that doesn't really help the attacker. But if we reverse engineer the iCloud protocol and figure out a way to talk to a secondary iCloud account, we can fully bypass little snitch. And the user can't really do anything about this because this is an undeletable system rule. So if we reverse the iCloud protocol, uh, we can see there's kind of a lot going on, but it's a JSON-based protocol, so it's pretty easy to understand. So here we describe the four steps to exfiltrate data to a secondary, to an attacker's iCloud um, account, specifically the iDrive. So in step one, we create a login request to basically authorize the secondary iCloud account. We then send an init upload request, which gives us uh, a URL where we can put the file. Step three, we actually upload the file to iCloud, the iDrive. And then in step four, we commit the uh, transaction just to kind of complete it. So this is how it looks in Python, just kind of a bunch of steps, but it's mostly just replaying a lot of the parameters that iCloud gives us back. So we can use this, though, to exfiltrate any data we want to uh, iCloud. Again, Little Snitch will see the connection, but it says, oh, it's going to iCloud. I'll let it through. So even if this is an unsigned, untrusted process that's never been seen before, because Little Snitch has this rule, it will allow any traffic through. All right, so I kind of wanted now to put everything all together to describe kind of a sample end-to-end -end attack, uh, mostly to test these third-party security products, um, but also to show how easy it is to make uh, some more advanced OSX malware. So its infection vector, vector would be this malicious dilib that we either convince the users to download, or if we have network-level access, we can inject into legitimate downloads that are over HTTP. When it's run, it persists using a dilib hijack attack, so that every time the user logs in, the code will be automatically started. 
Uh, since it's using a dialib, it's pretty stealthy because it's hosted in the process context of a trusted uh, Apple process. Uh, when it's run then, it exfiltrates a bunch of files from the user, just grabs some of their photos, sends them out to iDrive, iCloud, and then it downloads and executes some commands. Now this isn't the most sophisticated malware, but it represents essentially what all malware pretty much wants to do, which is infect the user, persist, exfil files, download and execute code, stuff like that. Another thing is this doesn't require root to run. So I tested this against a variety of third-party security products, basically every single third-party security product I could find, um, and Apple's built-in ones as well. And the test was simple. I'd basically download the uh, antivirus product, which was unfortunately over HTTP, and then allow it to update so it had the latest signatures. Uh, I would then run the uh, unsafe.dmg file, this was the malicious DMG file, and then I would see if the antivirus personal security product, firewall product, detected and blocked any component of this attack. And if it did, that would be a win for the antivirus product, and a loss for the malware. So again, I said, would the antivirus product or the firewall detect the malicious DMG file? Would it detect the persistence? Would it detect the dialib hijack? Would it detect the exfiltration of data, the download of commands, the execution of commands? Any of these detected and blocked, that would be a fail. Well, no real surprises here. None of them detected any component of this attack. So, you know, I'm sure a lot of you guys already know this, but this is kind of shows the ineptitude of these antivirus products, these personal security products. All right, so I love my Mac. Uh, you know, I've definitely drank the apple juice, um, but it's so easy to hack and so easy to, you know, persist to write malware for, right? If I can write malware to bypass everything, there's tons of other people out there that can do the same thing. So kind of my side hobby is to write Mac security tools for my personal Mac to secure it um, and share them for free. You know, sharing is caring. So the first tool I wrote is basically auto runs for OS X. Uh, it's called Knock Knock, and it's fairly simple. Basically, when I say knock knock, I want it to tell me who's there. In other words, I want to know all the software that's persisted on my Mac computer that is automatically started whenever the user logs in or the computer uh, is rebooted. Uh, it's a nice UI tool, makes it easy to distribute. Uh, it's got some nice UI, so you know you can look at the file, get some information about it. But the coolest feature I think is the virus total integration. So knock knock proper doesn't make any differentiation between something that's malware and not. It will filter out signed Apple. Um, binaries, but legitimate third-party software will show up as well by design because I didn't want to miss any you know new malware. However, with the virus total integration, it sends a hash to a virus total of all the files it finds, and if it's known malware, that will pop up in red and let you know that you're infected. Uh, you can turn that feature off if you don't want it generating any network traffic as well. Now this is a great tool, but the problem is it's uh, somewhat reactive, right? You run it, and then after the fact, it'll show you if there's something persisted on your box that's not supposed to be there. So yeah, so knock knock will tell you who that, who's there, block block, I know, really creative names, will tell you when someone is moving in. So what it does is it provides continual real-time protection to monitor known persistence locations, and then anytime anyone tries to monitor the, modify these locations and install something new, it will pop up and tell you that, hey, you know, process XYZ is trying to do this, um, and give you as much information as you need, and then you can block it if you want. Now the cool thing is, unlike a firewall, which is popping up all the time and gets super freaking annoying, this rarely, rarely pops up. And this is because most software doesn't create new persistence uh, components. So I've been running this for a few months, uh, and the only time it popped up is when I installed Photoshop, a legit copy, um, and Adobe then installed some licensing checks or updating software or something, so it popped up and I allowed it. Now I am going to point out this is in beta, uh, so you know maybe don't run it on your production systems. So these tools and uh, some others, uh, I also have a tool that can detect applications that are vulnerable to dialib hijacking or tell you if any applications have been hij hijacked can be downloaded from objectivec.com. There's also some cool malware samples on there that you guys can download, play with. Um, when I started getting into Mac security, reverse engineering Mac malware, I found it very hard to get recent copies of OS X malware. Antivirus companies just don't like sharing. They're like this little high school click. Um, so I spent a lot of time collecting these samples. Um, so all the ones I talked about today in these slides can be downloaded as well. Just don't infect yourself. Um, and I'm also writing other tools, so check back. Um, again, these are always free, you know, no strings attached. These are just what I run on my Mac and I figured I should share. All right, so wrapping this all up. Um, hopefully I've shown you that current OSX malware is pretty lame. Uh, fairly amateur, easy to detect, easy to prevent. Uh, but you know, to be fair, so are the antivirus products. Hopefully, though, I showed you how to, you know, how we could uh, or inspire you how to write better Mac malware, right? How we can 
uh, infect existing downloads, how we can persist in more stealthy ways, how we can protect our malware samples, um, how to do process injection, and then how to bypass all of Apple's and third-party security products. So thank you for your time. Uh, you guys can uh, find me on Twitter, email me, I'll be around all day, um, and then check out the tools on objectivec.com. So that is a wrap. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. So actually, Synac proper really doesn't do anything Mac related. This is just like my side passion, I guess you would say. Um, so what we do is, um, yeah, mostly we do mobile, websites, IoT devices, and um, network, basically pen testing. Um, so we have vetted security researchers signed up all over the world that basically will, in a controlled environment, hack, try to hack in and find vulnerabilities, and then we pay them out on a, on a, you know, as they find vulnerabilities. So that's like Synac. Yes. Yeah, that's a great, great question. And I would say um, the majority, so the question was, you know, how many of these um, exploits, techniques translate over to iOS? So since iOS is so locked down and basically doesn't allow unsigned code to run, even though the code may still be vulnerable, like, you, you know, you plant a dilib, it's not going to get loaded because it's unsigned. Um, so, you know, iOS is actually locked down really well. Um, so generally, these techniques are pretty much Mac specific. Uh, overall. Ian might prove me wrong, but. <laughs> yeah, in the front. Yeah. So Ian probably will talk more about this. The question was, are the uh, vulnerabilities for the Mac App Sandbox uh, public? Um, so what Google Project Zero does is they release them after 90 days. Um, Apple patches some of those, and some of those are unpatched. Um, so most of the ones I mentioned probably are patched, but I know that there are some unpatched ones that are publicly available because Apple has not patched them yet. But this also, I mean, the Google guys are super smart, but this also shows that there's like lots of bugs to be found. So I'm sure there are people out there who have their own private bugs, unfortunately. So anything else? Awesome. Well, thanks again, guys.